All right, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Kim Batchelder, and I am the Vegetation Management Coordinator for Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District. Uh, I welcome you to our community outreach uh, webinar. Uh, we are hoping to address the topic of vegetation management and wildfire resilience tonight uh, on Wednesday, October 26. The we this webinar uh, will be recorded and the video will be available on the county's website as well as Ag and Open Spaces website. Uh, that will probably take about a day to be able to process that. Uh, let's begin with uh, a brief message from Gilbert Martinez to, uh, from our communications department to help our, uh, our participants uh, for translation services. Gilbert? Buenas noches y bienvenidos a la sesión informativa. Esta sesión informativa se puede escuchar en vivo con interpretación al español. Para escuchar la versión en español, por, por favor haga un clic en el icono del globo que se encuentra al pie de la página y elige su idioma al español. Y ahora regresamos para atrás con Kim Batchelor. Muy bien. Muchas gracias, Gilbert. Um, uh, so we are going to have lots of different uh, ways in which you can make comments or uh, ask your questions. Uh, you will see at the bottom of your uh, screen, there is a um, question and answers Q&A uh, button. You can press that and uh, write your questions to our panel. We have a very distinguished uh, panel tonight. So um, some of those questions will be answered immediately from my panelists. Uh, others will be elevated to uh, the facilitator or me, and we'll be able to address those questions at the right timing. We are going to present a fair amount of information uh, and then take a break, a pause to uh, address specific questions that address that particular uh, topic. And so if you have a question that might be later in the agenda, we might ask you to uh, hold on that question and then we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, the other, uh, we do wish that there's going to be several participants on this uh, webinar. So if you do uh, go live on our panel when we ask for your questions or comments, we ask you to keep those questions or comments to about two minutes so we can keep uh, staying on our progress and make as much progress on this as possible. Um, we have a very distinguished group of folks, and I really wanted to introduce you those folks, but let's uh, take a look at our agenda for the evening. All right, let's go to view slideshow. All right. Uh, can I get a head nod from our panelists that that's visible? Great, thank you very much. So again, welcome to our webinar tonight. Here's our agenda. We're going to focus on uh, providing you a sense of what the objectives of the uh, Healthy Forests Ad Hoc uh, Committee uh, consist of. We would like to give you a rundown of several of the thematic areas that were uh, described in the CLE report, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, we will talk about the prioritization of treatments throughout the county and how we're hoping to do that throughout the, the county. Uh, we then will be provided with a vision and coordination of county departments and organizations, and then describe a little bit about what has been happening in the area of workforce development and capacity building. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, describe a little bit about what a Healthy Forest Ad Hoc Committee is and where that is places, uh, how it is uh, structured. Uh, to begin with, it was a board action that was set to establish the ad hoc committee. And so uh, in that case, the, there are two supervisors that are uh, attached to a particular topic. In this case, Healthy Forest was the uh, name of this particular ad hoc. And Supervisor Gore and Supervisor Hopkins were listed as the key uh, supervisors that would address this particular area. So uh, with that, I'd like to ask uh, Supervisor Gore and Supervisor Hopkins to share their insights as to why they decided to develop this particular ad hoc and what are some of their expectations for us to meet tonight. Thank you very much, Kim. I'll jump in. Uh, my name is James Gore. It's a pleasure to see everybody. Uh, well, what am, I, what am I saying? I can't see you all. <laughs> I can see my fellow panelists. Um, it's great to see uh, the individuals who have joined us. Uh, John Mack from Permit Sonoma, uh, Caitlin Cornwall, Misty, uh, and Kim, you're on my screen right now and there's many more coming. Um, I am inspired by the work that you all are doing. Uh, those of you in your homes, 
and also uh, those individuals who are participating as either a technical advisory council or really uh, getting these uh, projects, putting them on the ground, achieving risk reduction, uh, doing it in a way that honors CEQA, review, environmental requirements, building the partnerships uh, to not just have short-term veg management, but long-term healthy forests. And I say this because uh, we've taken so many so much action. We've taken so much uh, in terms of the CLE report and then following up with specific allocations of funding for projects, for active projects on the ground, which we want to see, i.e. risk reduction. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that this is done in a smart way. It's done with the right partners, the right agencies. It's done with your voice, your input. Uh, and it's done in a way that uh, achieves long-term uh, success, long-term risk reduction and healthy forests. Uh, one of the main reasons that I'll, I'll say that we created this and that I, I, as the chair this year, said, you know, I want to create a, a healthy forest ad hoc was because the issue of veg management was um, not just an effort and veg management is a practice, but it's, it's really what's the culture of what we pursue going forward. How do we use the funding that we set aside, the $25 million from the veg management portfolio out of the PG&E settlement dollars to achieve the longest uh, form of success? But I will also want to acknowledge a different side of it, which is that I was hearing a lot of concerns from folks. And so was my colleague, Supervisor Hopkins. You know, we represent between districts four and five, about 80 to 85 percent of the forest lands in Sonoma County. And the goal of this is to do risk reduction, but also it's to do it in a way that's environmentally conscious. It's a way to achieve healthy ecosystems. And I was hearing a lot of different things come up from different uh, uh, voices. So sometimes it would be, hey, we don't think you should do vegetation management because um, it's reducing the carbon sequestration opportunities in your forest. It's actually going to exacerbate fires. You're hearing from other folks who said, uh, we don't support vegetation management. You should actually give us more permits to be able to do the management ourselves on our lands. Um, and so what we really wanted to do is put science at the forefront with foresters, ecologists, and others, and then have, an, have a real conversation the way that Ag and Open Space did with the Vital Lands Initiative which had so many partners. And I saw Kim put a lot of those partner logos on the screen and to make sure we have the right people at the table to figure out where we are at together and where we have differences of opinion. And then where do we go from there? Final thing I wanna say is, is that I had um, some folks recently talk to me about uh, concerns about that there's already a plan for um, an agency formation, a joint powers authority, a regional authority. and The county is taking away authority of of vegetation management from districts and other things. And I, uh, I just want to address that. I haven't been a part of any of those conversations. Those on this uh, call have not either. So I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to say what they're excited about, what they're concerned about, so that we don't assume intent from each other. Um, and I will say my intent is definitely to go back to our board, which is going to be on uh, December 13th and review vegetation management again not from Supervisor Hopkins and I, just from an ad hoc, but the entire board, where we wanna put our, our next round of investments and to have you all engaged and your voice be a part of that here and there. And then we wanna play that forward and make sure that whatever we do in terms of a stewardship, not just veg management, but stewardship of these forest lands is, uh, is uh, everybody understands you know, what science we're using, where they agree, where they don't agree, and how that conversation can continue. I do see us creating some kind of a uh, entity, some kind of a risk reduction authority, but we will get into that. Um, that's just an idea. I don't know what that looks like. That has to have your input. Do we want to get future funding, sustainable funding, not just pg &E? Heck yeah. But we have to build towards that. And a lot of what we've seen and that Kim, you and others are going to go through, it really creates the case for continued investment. So I'll pass it over to my colleague, uh, Supervisor Hopkins, who I admire and we work very well together on these issues. And, uh, um, and then we'll just, get Kim, take it away. And uh, I'm, my, my goal is to be an active participant, a listener, and to hear from anybody who has Q&A so that we can take that into our uh, program going forward. Appreciation. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Supervisor Hopkins? 
Thank you so much. Um, you know, I really see tonight as an opportunity to take a pause and look at where we've been and also where we're going. And where we've been is that the folks that you see on this panel before you this evening have literally been through hell and high water together. And those experiences that we've gone through of repeat catastrophic wildfire have brought us together to what I believe is an unprecedented level, level of collaboration across jurisdiction, across agency, under a common goal, which is how do we keep our, health, our forests healthy and how do we keep our communities safe? And I really fundamentally believe that those are not mutually exclusive goals. That is sort of one goal under a shared umbrella. And we're so lucky to have the subject matter expertise of folks like Chief Nichols, as well as Carol Leon Safford, and then the opportunity to also bring ecosystem services and, and a sort of ecological lens from people like Misty Arias from Ag and Open Space, as well as Hattie Brown. Um, and, you know, I, I think that what we need to do here tonight is recognize how fortunate we are that we have come together under this common goal, but also still how far we have to go. And that's the conversation that I really want to have and hear from folks, which is how do we take these kind of relationships that have been forged, right? Take all of the fantastic subject matter expertise that is here tonight and carry it forward. Because James and I work great together, but at the end of the day, it shouldn't be politicians kind of making decisions about funding and about what to do and what not to do. We need to have the subject matter expertise to be able to make data-driven decisions um, that again, prioritize community safety as well as ecosystem services. And finally, um, I chose this background for a reason. This is actually the Grove of Old Trees up by Occidental. And I don't know if I lean, I feel like maybe you can see a picture of um, my daughter when she was younger and us walking down the path. But really, this is what it's about. It's about future generations. It's about opportunities to cherish our open space. Um, you know, and one of the special things that you'll see when you go up to the Grove of Old Trees are the fire scars on the redwoods, right? And how do we bring fire back to this landscape in the way that it has been part of this landscape for thousands of years without fear? but really with purpose. So I look forward to hearing from all of you this evening and super excited to be part of this effort going forward. All right, great. Thank you very, very much for those comments. Um, so let's continue on. Um, let me see if I can get a, there we go. So um, one of the uh, unique parts of this particular ad hoc is I uh, asked, uh, Misty and I asked to see if we could go and uh, approach the questions that uh, have been posed to us in the sense of a technical advisory committee. And that's the organizations you see represented today. Um, I can't thank enough these folks who took the time out to really dive deep into what uh, the CLE recommendations were about, and I'll get into those, what that is. We have expertise in uh, folks who are very familiar with um, how to do this work on the ground, like Pepperwood uh, staff, uh, you have UC Extension, who's done an incredible amount of work on developing various tools. Uh, same with Sonoma Waters, developing a number of different tools you'll hear about tonight. Fire It Forward has been doing instrumental work on the type of training it takes to get uh, crews to do prescribed burns. And then the uh, NGOs like Sonoma Ecology Center, they've been able to provide great uh, uh, expertise into how to do fuel treatments in the most responsible way possible. Um, as uh, well as our county uh, programs, we I really uh, appreciate the work that each one of us have done, and you'll be able to get a chance to hear from some of those tonight. Okay, so uh, to continue our conversation, I really wanted to highlight some of the key advances and accomplishments that we've had to date. So uh, for instance, currently we are uh, managing 46 different vegetation management grant agreements that were uh, asked uh, to be created since 2021. So we used about $8.3 million of the pg and &E funding, and we're able to match out with $1.1 million of additional funds to carry out these projects over uh, across Sonoma County. Um, there's defensible uh, space assessments, 10 of the 14 communities have been outreach to. Uh, there's seven regional collaborations, that's uh, groups that are working together to try to do this work on a larger scale. Uh, we've had great uh, private sector and public sector interaction, for instance, the California Water, uh, working with um, the uh, Son uh, Permit Sonoma and regional parks to create a good fuel break between the communities that live uh, on uh, the borders of those areas. There's 11 uh, vegetation treatment programs that are plans that are going through right now as we speak. 
Those are helping to do large scale treatments across a large uh, variety of different habitat types. Uh, we've had hosted at least 25 different community workshops, webinars, field events, opportunities for people to get on the ground to learn more about what is uh, proper fuel management? What is the uh, protection of watersheds? All these things are rolled up in together and to try to share more information with more people uh, on the ground. And then there's been a tremendous amount of data that's been generated since 2017 when uh, the Tubbs fire hit our area and the Nuns fire in the areas that have been burned. We've developed a, a great cadre of data that we've been able to use. But not only that, we're starting to use tools that can help us to consolidate that data and really interpret it so we can make better decisions in the, in the future. And then finally, I wanted to mention the tremendous amount of uh, workforce development that's happened by the um, Sonoma or the Santa Rosa J Junior College, who's developing a wildfire resilience certificate program. The uh, Fire Forward has been able to train 350 basic wildland uh, firefighters and have helped to do over 185 prescribed burns since 2017. So with that, there's a lot of different accomplishments in the area. Um, I, I, I wanna, I'm sure I get a chuckle from many of my colleagues uh, by throwing up this screen or this next shot, but I, I really wanna illustrate in this slide the complexity of the information that we're managing. And I really want us to focus on what is particularly what we're going to be addressing tonight. Um, the county has made some great strides in learning to have early detection of uh, fires, warning systems, um, but via social media or uh, telephones, we're getting more advanced notices of events that are happening in the future. That's a huge advancement since 2017. We also are, are learning how to best defend those. And we're not going to be focusing on those particular elements, but instead we're going to be focusing on these three areas, vegetation management, defensible space, and structural hardening. These are strategies to help us advance those things. But by all means, we've already made some advances. What we're trying to do now is trying to work closer together so that we can accomplish these goals in a way that's most efficient, that uses the funding that we have right now in the, most, in the best way possible to leverage additional funding and be able to do this work uh, over time. But one of the things that we recognize is that when we think about uh, the types of modeling and monitoring that we should be doing, that's one thing that we really wanna focus on as we get uh, closer, as we move and do these types of treatments, how is it effective on the ground? Are these communities more uh, safer? Uh, are these communities able to be able to evacuate uh, in uh, an organized fashion? But also monitor those uh, impacts on wildlife, watershed protection, and all these other factors. And then finally, I wanted to just highlight these two other boxes where we have tremendous amount of experience with uh, understanding structural success, like being able to harden homes and protect defensible space. But the area that we think we need to do more in is the area of cultural and personal attitudes. How do we improve our ability to accept that fire is part of the equation and move that forward? So with that, I wanted just to provide this conceptual view of what vegetation management and uh, wildfire resilience uh, looks like. Uh, this is just an example, but we just wanted to think about this in, in three concentric circles. The focal area will be around the communities where we are looking at doing structure hardening efforts and defensible space in those small parcels in the community center and the exteriors of those communities. But then the next uh, layer out, we want to think about more of the landscape level treatments where we can think about shaded fuel breaks and evacuation routes. How do we introduce uh, prescribed grazing or prescribed fire? Things that will have an impact on the natural systems, but we, can, we wanna do in the immediate vicinities of these communities that we're trying to protect. And then the third uh, layer out, we're looking at ways in which we can help to restore or uh, protect natural resources that, such as using prescribed fire or ecological restoration and protection of those natural resources through things like conservation programs or conservation easements where we have areas that we wanna protect. That's just a conceptual view of how we're trying to address uh, vegetation management and fire, wildfire resilience. So <clears throat> with that, I wanna launch into what is uh, part of our recommendation. So 
2017, um, or actually in 2020, uh, the county uh, won a lawsuit to against PG&E uh, in order to and receive their settlement for $149 million uh, from uh, uh, PG&E. Uh, at that time, the Board of Supervisors decided to dedicate $25 million to vegetation management. And in order to organize how that would be done, uh, they contracted with a group called the Center for Law and uh, Energy and the Environment out of the University of Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, to be able to help organize a series of uh, workshops where um, experts in uh, wildlife protection, uh, wild, wildfire management, um, service, uh, fire services, as well as uh, both experts from the Sonoma County as well as uh, others in the, in the state. And so that group came up with some recommendations that we're going to address tonight. Um, there are uh, several different recommendations that I wanna share with you. The actual um, uh, kind of paraphrased version of each category is in the italics um, uh, font, if you will, uh, right after the name of the thematic area. So that was what was proposed to do. And then the follow-up was the recommendations. And so uh, this is the one category where we were able to accomplish and complete uh, the, the first request that uh, the CLE report had recommended, immediate vegetation management activities. The idea was to provide funding to communities to help address areas that had high risk of uh, fire, wildfire or were uh, priority projects that were shovel ready support local organizations, communities, and try to find those different benefits to uh, doing fuel treatments in a variety of different ways. We were able to do um, two different cycles of the grant, the Vegetation Management Grant Program, uh, one in 2021 and another one in 2022. And as I mentioned in our first slide, we have 46 different grant agreements. So with that, our recommendation for that particular area, let me go up one more slide, is to provide funding through prioritized management projects um, that will enhance, we'll use the enhanced uh, selection process and criteria, and also utilize some of the priority tools that you'll hear in a, in a, in a moment under the, C, the, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan uh, and the uh, Project Entry Tool, as well as the Wildfire Resilience Planner. Uh, those words will make a little bit more sense as we get into our program. But then also we wanted to suggest a um, implementing a, a pilot project where we're providing technical assistance to three to five projects under that same umbrella using the CWPP as a uh, as the portal to get more support to these projects that show great potential but aren't quite there to be able to qualify for uh, Cal Fire grants or other grants that are more competitive. So um, with that, I wanted to share with you a map of the all the different. 46 projects throughout the county. Uh, and I uh, just mentioned a couple of different projects throughout the area. You'll mention uh, in the Pepperwood area, they're working on a strategic fuel break. Uh, there's, uh, there are um, shaded fuel breaks also in uh, district four and five where communities are developing uh, these projects on a scale that will help to protect those immediate communities. There are projects where there are um, evacuation routes, such as the Fort, uh, Fort Ross Road uh, corridor, where um, treatments are being done along the roadside. So it's a variety of different projects throughout the county. So um, with that, I just wanted to uh, take a pause. I'm sure you guys uh, could uh, use a break from my voice, but just uh, open it up to the panel to see if there's any other comments or questions that uh, come from the public, uh, maybe on these specific areas. But the idea is to try to have questions that address that are in this particular topic area. So with that, I'll um, stop sharing my screen and see if we have any panelists that we uh, or any folks that want to share any questions. And so I see there's a there's a question in the Q&A, but I think it might be for a um, maybe more appropriate for a later part of the agenda. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Stuart, is that uh, correct? Correct. OK, that's great. OK, 
So let's uh, move on to our next area. Thank you. Um, and go back to our slideshow. All right. So um, the next section we wanted to do, excuse me, there we go, um, is the outreach and education uh, factor. This is another uh, part of the CLE report where the outreach and education capacity to spearhead communications through with landowners and businesses to show that there's private uh, individuals can reduce uh, fire risk. Uh, I mentioned several of the workshops we've done throughout the county. Um, and these were the specific recommendations that our technical advisory committee came up with, uh, thinking about uh, specifically providing a county website where landowners and resource managers can find highlighted the different types of grant programs, technical assistance providers, best management practice, and other resources that will be available. I'm really pleased to announce that through the great efforts of the uh, UC Ex Cooperative Extension, their team has really developed the backbones of a website that we hope to launch in December and share with the board uh, at our next um, uh, presentation on this, uh, December 13th. We are starting to see uh, a, an absolute need. This is something the supervisors had asked for um, uh, in our last meeting in uh, April. And there's a lot of information that we're trying to hone down so that the website is easy to manage and that uh, landowners will have a chance to be able to access a lot of this great information. Uh, we also are hopeful to offer training courses and outreach programs uh, by and building community capacity in project development, uh, CEQA or environmental compliance, uh, the technical scope of vegetation management, uh, as well as thinking about a pre-grant or uh, thinking about how to develop your proposals so they're more competitive when it comes to a grant application through CAL FIRE or the US Forest Service or a number of other different grant offering services. Uh, we also felt it's important to support what the Sonoma County Forest Conservation Working Group is doing as well as Fire Safe Sonoma. One of the key things that we really wanted to emphasize uh, tonight is that collaboration is going to happen in many different scales. Uh, one of the things that the county is good at is helping to work and coordinate these different efforts. But when it comes to getting down on the ground with landowners, we really see the need for other entities like the, the RCDs, the Fire Safe Sonoma. They have good connections that are able to work with a lot of different partners and be able to provide that uh, support on the ground. And uh, then finally, I really wanted to highlight another uh, factor that we want to uh, uh, support, and that is the Living with Fire uh, Sonoma County Forest Management Conference in April of next year. This will be um, hosted by Sonoma County Forest Conservation Working Group, UC Cooperative Extensions, and a number of other partners that are part of that process. So we encourage you to stay tuned for that. So with the next slide, I want to move into the area of data prioritization, planning, and mapping. And so this is where I mentioned in the first slide, all the advances that we have made uh, through the types of data that we're getting. We've collected a ton of information about how the fire affected our landscapes. And now we wanna use that information to be able to help us to prioritize our work in the future. And so one a great advance will be uh, uh, additional LIDAR um, uh, data that will be uploaded in the middle of next year. This is showing a, um, a indication of where vegetation has been altered by uh, fires that have, we've experienced over the last five years and help us to understand how those trends are affecting and how we might be able to influence those trends in ways in which to reduce uh, wildfire in specific areas. So with that, the next thing I wanted to focus on is the Wildfire Resilience Planner. And tonight we have uh, uh, Sashi Sabaratnam to be able to share with us the advances of this particular tool that we hope to use in a larger uh, context. So uh, Sashi, do you wanna take over from here, please? Yep, um, hopefully you can all hear me. The place that I'm at all of a sudden just got really loud at the moments before I was meant to speak here. So my apologies if, if it's difficult to hear. Kim, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you all for being here. And I know some of you have heard about the uh, Wildfire Resilience Decision Support Framework, um, which we are now calling 
the Wildfire Resilience Planner and its connection to a tool that you may be familiar with, the Wildfire Fuel Mapper, which UC Cooperative Extension and Pepperwood jointly developed together. Uh, the Wildfire Resilience Planner is being uh, developed uh, with uh, UC Cooperative Extension and Sonoma Water as project leads and with Conservation Biology Institute as the developer. And uh, in late 2019, some of you may have been a part of the uh, stakeholder engagement process to figure out what would be the best way to assist in um, prioritizing and in, in figure out what work there should be done um, towards the end of wildfire resilience and also considering other co-benefits. And what the, the, the answer that came back resoundingly was, we wanna be able to prioritize work based on the data, based on, uh, scientific criteria, and we want to be able to um, do that as well as doing opportunistic work. So the resilience planner is meant to operate at the landscape level scale and allow the user, which the users are, are probably going to be county agencies and the resource conservation districts and other groups that tend to work at a larger, not, not just one parcel scale, uh, so that they can de uh, denote what assets they want to prioritize and assets could be uh, natural assets such as uh, streams, um, you know, repairing areas, um, forests, or it could be um, community assets, you know, lives and property, homes, critical infrastructure. That's the asset prioritization model there on that first slide. Um, and then wants to overlay that with the wildfire hazard risk, um, which we in Sonoma County are lucky to have from Techman Geospatial. Um, this is to a scale that is not available in all counties. Um, and the intersection of those two things gives you an idea of where you should prioritize the work. And that's uh, what we see on the third screen capture there below. This product is now in beta. We are having county agencies kind of test it out and, and uh, road test it and break it and you know, make sure that it's working the way it's intended to work. Um, but ultimately, it would be something where a any group like a county agency or any collaborative group that's working at a landscape scale could use this tool to prioritize where they're going to, to, to indicate what assets they want to prioritize protecting, uh, figure out what their plan is, and then share that with the public so that you can see what the, that prioritization is. So Sonoma Water is going to prioritize things a little bit differently than, let's say, um, Ag and Open Space is, or let's say then Permit Sonoma is, because they each have different uh, areas of focus. So that's what the Wildfire Resilience Planner is. Um, next slide, please, Kim. And that's working at the landscape scale. The uh, tool that you all are probably familiar with, uh, some of you may be familiar with, is the Wildfire Fuel Mapper that is at the parcel level scale. The Fuel Mapper is a set of layers. You can see there the kind of the summary of the report there. Um, at the parcel level, uh, they've been, these reports were generated for parcels of around three acres and up. And it is something you can use to, at the parcel level, figure out how you're going to prioritize your own work. The uh, North Coast Research Partnership has funded a LIDAR scan of the vegetative fuels in the whole North Coast region. So in the next year, there'll be new data and we're working on updating these maps and figuring out a way for them to be dynamically generated and taken into the field so that you can ground truth um, the information and, and use it for your plan. So this is all Kim, you're uh, muted. Kim, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. I think we may have lost Sashi on that last slide. So let's see if she comes back. All right. Well, um well, this is a perfect time to pause and have a question. So are there any questions specifically about the uh, the wildfire resilience planner tool or the fuel mapper? Um, uh, uh, Caitlin, do you see any questions? Uh, and then I'll uh, stop sharing to see if there's any hands raised. Yeah, we do have um, uh, the, the last question that's in the Q&A from Tom um, is on this topic. Uh, the question is, um, if these locally developed decision support tools are not yet meeting CAL FIRE's competitive grant requirements, what is the county going to do about that? Um, you, can, you can read the full text of the question. Right. I'm not sure uh, if it's right. Uh, let me see. So um, 
So one of the things that we have tried to work with is developing a technical assistance uh, grant program. And one of the challenges was to try to figure out an equitable way to share that uh, or to share that information, that, that funding. Uh, that was something that we proposed in April to the supervisors for their approval. And they set aside $500,000 for technical assistance. And so we are working with the, uh, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan uh, and Permit Sonoma to provide that portal where projects can be entered into that program and then uh, be listed onto a map that um, Carleon will share in a moment. And uh, through that, we will be able to hopefully select projects that have a chance to show more, more potential and might just need some support from a CEQA perspective, environmental compliance, uh, or it might be technical prescriptions. Maybe they need someone who has greater expertise in uh, the, the particular habitat type that we're trying to work with. So that, that's one of the uh, challenges that we're gonna be trying to meet on, through that effort. Um, does that answer your question, uh, Mr. Conlon? Conlon, please. Okay, so uh, we can follow up with that question. Um, Sashi, is there anything else that you'd like to share? You were uh, cutting out at the end. I of know, the I'm so master. sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, uh, I, I basically covered um, the two tools and the, uh, I just, I guess I just wanted to say that the, the Board of Supervisors um, funded both of these tools to, so that the, um, the best available data could be used by everyone really um, uh, to, to, to benefit the community and really to allow um, the members of the community to be able to kind of you know, fight for the values that are important to them and that we can all work together um, towards these goals. So you know, very appreciative that the, that the board has been so thoughtful in providing those supports and um, you'll be hearing more about the, everything, both of those tools in the future. That's great. Thank you for that, Sashi. And uh, one thing that I really wanted to emphasize with those two tools is that um, it's really critical to understand that those tools work at really two different scales. The fuel mapper is really parcel specific and the, uh, uh, the wildfire resilience planner is really to help us look at the landscape and trying to think exactly where are the priority areas that we need to focus. And I think that's, that's the, uh, the part that I think has been really innovative so far is that every time we continue to provide a new service like uh, the vegetation management grant program, we've tried to make it better. In year one of the grant program, it was kind of a shotgun approach. In year two, we looked at how to consolidate and do, uh, do the value additive projects. And so um, through the, the, the uh, community wildfire protection plan, I think there's a good chance we will be able to consolidate even further by going through these different tools. And with that, I'd like to move on to our next speaker. Speaker, which Tim, is we actually have Stafford. two hands raised. If you'd okay, like to great. hear from him, we have Eric and then D. I'm going to unmute Eric. Okay, good. Thank you. Go ahead, Eric. Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Eric Pearson. I'm in down in District One on the Mayakama Mountains. Um, we have a fire set council. Um, Kim, we've met before. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity here. Um, question on the technical assistance. You know, we, we found that. Um, as for as little as five thousand dollars, someone else will package up, write the whole grant for us. Um, is that is is does the county plan to give out money to help subsidize um, those grant writing? Because um, it, that that seems to make sense because you know we're going to be applying for grants for three, four, or five hundred thousand um, dollars, and it's just a great way to leverage, in our opinion, some of the count, county's cash um, to to bring in money from. Um, from the state and the feds. I really appreciate the comment. I absolutely appreciate the need. Uh, we have seen that in several different cases where groups are just needing someone who can help organize their thoughts and how to do uh, a proper proposal. Uh, at this point, we, we don't have a specific criteria for how to support projects when it comes to uh, grant writing and, prep and preparation of those proposals, but we do want to see proposals or projects that have really shown potential to really have a positive effect on reducing uh, the risk of fire in a particular community. So um, that's the best answer I'll give for right now, but okay. also that it's a project that's going to be 
in the making. So that's great input that we will certainly note uh, in our uh, comment section. And I appreciate you saying something. I've got one more question, may I? Oh, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, on the mapping, uh, we're, we're particularly looking at some invasive species because they, they won the acacia specifically on the way up Trinity Road. Uh, it grows so quick that we can't keep it off the road. So we're we're concerned about egress and whatnot. And also whether it's scotch broom or acacia or uh, stink or all those invasives seem to burn and be, you know, rather hot spots on the mountain. Um, through that that LIDAR, I, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming you're using for mapping. Is there a way to, um, to map out or does the county have resources um, to be able to show us where all the invasives are on a, on a mountain, specifically the acacia? That's a great question. Does one of our panelists want to take that one? Uh, I think that uh, there there is um uh, there's a there's a way to get to that um, it, it, in the fuel map for layers. There are some uh, there is some information about the vegetation type, and there is some analysis that UC Cooperative Extension um, our, our uh, forester Mike Jones has done um, that would include some of that. And um, we're working on trying to get some of that information in data layers that would be available to the public. Um, but that's also uh, something that uh, I think you'd maybe start with something like the fuel mapper where you're looking at your parcel specifically, and then you'd bring in uh, somebody, a specialist to help you, or somebody from the RCDs or someone from UC Cooperative Extension um, to uh, help you figure that out and kind of help you make your plan. Is that helpful? It is. Can you drop into the comments? Is that possible? Can you drop into the comments the link to that map? To the, yes, to the fuel mapper? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. And I'll, I'll follow up with that uh, uh, question with just uh, one other comment that the um, LIDAR data that I mentioned helped us to develop the vegetation map that uh, has uh, been widely used since 2013. However, that data is antiquated, and that's one of the reasons we need to do more LIDAR flyovers. And uh, thanks to North Coast Regional um, Partnership, they're helping to do a LIDAR uh, flyover in January or February uh, to of uh, the whole North Coast uh, from the Bay Area up to the Oregon coastline. So that'll be a rich source of data that will help us to narrow down and see the type of vegetation cover that hopefully will be able to highlight some of those uh, invasive plant uh, populations. So stay tuned on that one. Um, can we hear from Dee Swanhauser? Okay, here. Thanks. Go ahead, Dee. Two quickies. When will CAL FIRE's updated wildfire hazard maps be available to the public? And can landowners get one-on-one -on -one help understanding how to use these maps and who to contact since Sashi suggested they could contact? How are they going to know how to get in touch with who about these maps? Thank you. That's a great question. I'll take the first crack and then I'll ask uh, Ben or um, maybe Carleon knows the answer to the first question as well. Um, the, as far as how to get the information out to landowners, I think that's one of the things we see as valuable contributions of groups like uh, the resource conservation districts. Uh, they, have a, they have great staff that can be able to work with landowners on an individual basis. But I think it also, um, leads to the need for greater outreach and workshops so that we can have a more consolidated effort. So there's a lot of landowners who need that information. And I think uh, groups like the Forest Conservation Working Group can also help serve that uh, as a conduit to that information. Um, let me see, on the panel, maybe Asashi, Asashi, do you have other recommendations since that's a part of uh, UC Extension's work as well? Sorry, I was trying to answer a Q&A question. Um, uh, so, uh, Dee, you were asking uh, where people could get access to, to the maps or, or, or where they could get access to further assistance on the maps. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in, are you still able to hear me? I don't know. Yeah, we can hear you, Dee. Okay, good. So, um, it, it's how to, you know, I, I know people have heard about these maps. Oh my God, how am I gonna learn how to use them? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and where will I find out they're even available and who to more specifically contact? I know it's a right. big you know, issue. What about reaching out to landowners 
this is, you're not gonna, you're gonna laugh via a postcard or <laughs> other modern ways, but to reach, really get out to these folks. So there yeah. you go. That's good. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Dia, I, I, so I can't answer that part of it. Uh, so, uh, that uh, UC Cooperative Extension has actually been thinking about doing a landowner needs assessment survey that might, you know, sort might sort of look like that. But mainly, where where all of us are concentrating our efforts is where the collaboration is already happening. So, if there are landowners that are already working together, they have a fire safe council, they put together a lo local CWPP, they're um, you know working together with the RCDs. The you know fire not only knows no jurisdictional boundaries, it knows no par parcel boundaries. So, uh, people working together as a community, that's where you have to start. And you you would uh, that's actually the hardest part of the work. The technical assistance, in in fact, is is considerably easier oh. once you have a group together. So, I think that um, the uh, where I would kind of put that back is um, as much as you know, those who are here can be champions for organizing your neighbors and getting people together, then it makes it much, much easier for our limited resources, you know, as there always will be uh, it, with the RCDs, with UC Cooperative Extension, with all the resources that you've got here um, on this call, it makes it much easier to apply those resources effectively if you and your neighbors are already working together. So I, I think that that's really step one. And Kim's going to mention that a little bit later, the ways in which the county is going to uh, help build the community capacity as recommended in uh, the report, in the CLE report, and as is, is recommended in the CWPP. Uh, but I think start, start with that and then uh, reach out to UC Cooperative Extension, to the Resource Conservation Districts, um, or to uh, Kim with the Ag and Open Space District, and uh, we will make sure that you're connected with the resources that you need. I think it's an equity issue that, that some of these groups are organized, but I'll bet you the vast majority aren't. And we need to work at that scale. So I'll stop now, thank you. All right, thanks Steve for your comment. Um, Carlio, would you like to share with us the, uh, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, please? I'll, I'll share our screen with the presentation. Kim, so sorry to interrupt. There's still one hand raised if you want to go to that now or wait for questions I, later. I, I think we better wait just for uh, the interest of time. Uh, let's hold on to that question if you could, okay? Thank you very much. And so with that, um, Carleon, please take it away. Okay, good evening all. This is Carleon Safford with Permit Sonoma um, Fire Prevention Division. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about our progress on the update of the 2016 Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Um, this update's been led by Permit Sonoma Fire Prevention with a lot of help from uh, Fire Safe Sonoma, CAL FIRE, UCCE, um, and our contractor digital mapping solutions. Um, this update was funded by a grant from the FEMA Hazard Mitigation Program post 17. Next slide. So what is a CWPP or Community Wildfire Protection Plan? Um, it was originally defined in the Healthy Forest Restoration Act from the US Congress in 2003. Um, and there were only three requirements per the HFRA for a CWPP. And it was meant to be collaborative to bring in stakeholders from all levels, from the federal level all the way down to individual community members. Um, and pull them on their values and their perceptions of the risks and how to deal with them. Um, it must identify areas for hazardous fuels reduction and recommend types and methods of treatment. Um, the wildfire uh, risk index, which has been referred to and which is being used as the base in the wildfire planner um, is what we have developed in the plan for that. And it has to recommend measures to reduce the ignitability of structures which in 2003, that was a fairly new concept. Now we all understand just how important that piece of the puzzle is. Um, at base, it's a tool to encourage collaboration between agencies and community stakeholders and to help prioritize and implement um, high priority projects. Um, I think of it as a pathway to solutions more than as a solution itself. It's um, the CWPP is not regulatory. It doesn't provide funding but it does provide a platform where we can bring in everybody's thoughts and ideas on how we can solve the wildfire problem and help support high, high, high value projects. CWPP is a living document. We expect it to change um, over time. 
um, in, in all aspects. Next slide. So in our, our first draft, which we launched several months ago, um, we presented the, the hazard and wildfire risk indices, which were created as part of the process. Um, we created the Community Wildfire Protection Plan hub site, which is where you can see the wildfire risk index, the project entry tool, and most of the tools. And that a little tiny URL at the bottom for the hub site will take you there. It's pretty much easiest to get to both of these websites by just putting it in the browser as Sonoma CWPP hub, Sonoma CWPP web. Um, we had meetings in all five supervisory districts, two per district plus a couple of extras um, to ascertain what people wanted and needed and thought. Um, we created the draft CWPP, sent it out for review. Um, we got a lot of comments back on the review. Um, those comments have now been incorporated and our review of the second draft is currently sitting with our steering committee for the CWPP. Uh, next slide. Uh, the steering committee and internal review we're hoping will be complete by November 4th, which is like coming like a freight train. Um, with public reviews starting um, on November 16th, which is when we're hoping to po po uh, post the public draft, that will be on the CWPP website. And then we will be holding public review meetings via Zoom on November 29th, 6 to 7.30, and November 30th, 6 to 7.30. And we will put the links and the updates on our website, on the CWPP website. Um, and you can pop your email in chat if you want to be added to the CWPP list, and hopefully someone will send those chat messages to me. Um, comments will, from the public review will be incorporated. We're hoping to have the final version of the CWPP by December 10th. Um, with board and signatory acceptance February 28th, which is tentative at this point. So that's our process coming up. Next slide. Uh, just for clarity, uh, the uh, chat is not functional in this webinar, but you can send a note uh, via the Q&A if you're interested in signing up for the CWPP. Thank you. So our recommendations are, to complete and approve for um, the CWPP update, finalize the mapping and the pri pri um, prioritization strategies for a global overview of proposed projects throughout the county. Um, this having one place where lots of people are putting um, their projects into one map has been something that was pointed out by multiple other plans that have been developed, including the CLE report, um, like, we don't really know what people are doing because we don't have a central project entry point. And we will be working on making that so it's user friendly for folks out there at the community level and also can be used for um, agency projects. So we can really see where projects are happening. We can also see where they're not happening. And we can also take a look at those projects and find the high value projects that maybe need a little technical assistance to get them to the next level. Um, we'll be creating a collaborative review uh, ranking panel for projects that get entered um, in the process as well. So that is our, um, that's what's coming. And uh, we hope to see you all in the public meetings. That's great. Thank you very much, Carly. I appreciate the comments. And, and I think it, uh, we did do, as, as she mentioned, uh, a trial run of using the project entry tool uh, during the uh, 2022 vegetation grant pro, uh, program. Uh, and it was it was successful. We got a chance to hone the information down into uh, uh, reviewable amounts uh, and not too much narrative, but really zeroing in on the specific uh, uh, projects that and, have, and their, their prescriptions. But what, as you can see on the map, some of the blobs are extremely large. And so the actual treatment area is important to be able to specify where you are intending to do your project. And so we saw a need for some quality control, and I think that's going to be uh, coming forthcoming in, uh, in the next couple of months. So thank you for that presentation, Carleone. Um, with that, do we have any uh, specific questions to the, uh, about the CWPP? And 
I'll go ahead and stop sharing right now, see if there's any hands raised. There's a question in the Q&A that I think might be as appropriate here as anywhere else, which okay. is an early one, again, from Tom about um, uh, whether the county's effort on healthy forests and vegetation management is being integrated at all with the recovery framework from the ORR. Um, and uh, yeah, any, any response to that? Yeah. <laughs> I think the effort that was made in the ORR is certainly something that we are trying to integrate into both the work that's being done in the FEMA grants, which you'll hear about in a moment, but also with our technical advisory committee, we've uh, many of those groups, uh, the participants in our, in our technical advisory committee had participated in the ORR and uh, are aware of those types of, um, those that framework. Um, have we gone and crosswalked the types of efforts we're doing now with uh, the work, I think that's probably a step that we could probably do. I think that's a good recommendation. Thank you. And the CWPP too, in addition to sort of all those frameworks and the other plans, which are baked in, um, we're really adding a lot more of the public, what the public um, saw as their values and their um, projects. So there's uh, more of that in there. So it's a slightly different focus, but I would say that most of the recommendations of those other plans are acknowledged and baked into the CWPP. Perfect, thank you. I think one thing that we uh, didn't have available to us in the, at the time of the ORR was the wildfire uh, resilience planner, which helps us to consolidate a lot of data that is new and uh, hopefully will help us to be more careful about how we prioritize our work. So any other questions that may have come up or any uh, panelists want to speak um, to the panel? Supervisor Gore or Supervisor Hopkins, do you have anything that you'd like to add to at this point? We good? All right. Thank you. Keep going. Uh, all right, Appreciate sounds it. good. All right, so uh, let's continue to share our, my screen and we'll go to the next section. And this area um, has uh, evolved into a, a number of different uh, ways. And I think what, what the original CLEAR report asked was to try to figure out the right form of governance and coordination between the different stakeholders, uh, how to improve the capacity and centralize our county efforts in order to streamline permitting uh, and gather data, how to lead the outreach initiatives, uh, such as the new multi-agency working group. And so, I think in to some degree, uh, that is what we're trying to accomplish with the technical advisory committee. Uh, but what we tried to do in this case, we are not um, governance specialists. I think there's a number of people who have a lot of uh, other skills that are, should be taken into effect when you think about different types of governance. Uh, governance. But the way we looked at this particular question, this particular uh, thematic area, is what do our organizations and departments need to better complete our vegetation management for wildfire resilience? And so with that, I wanted to share with you our recommendations in this category. And this is not to specifically address how uh, a new governance form should be made, but instead to think about how do we get there? I think one of the things we're doing, and I think uh, Chief Nichols uh, really shared with us in our last session with the ad hoc, is that we have a lot of these really talented people who are working on these issues, but we've done it in a way that's a little bit haphazard or not very well uh, coordinated. And so I think the CLE report recognized that. And so what we have done with the technical advisory committee has been to think about how to better organize ourselves and do the work in a more consolidated way. And so for in this particular um, uh, thematic area, we thought there would be three different uh, technical advisory committees that could help serve that purpose. One, an organizational structure and funding analysis, a group that had the expertise to look at all the different models out there. There's the Napa FireWise, there's a Marin uh, Fire Prevention Authority. Uh, there's groups uh, in working throughout the uh, different counties that are coming up with their different solutions. And so 
we want to recognize that there, uh, there are some great models out there, but not all of them apply to Sonoma County. So we want to really uh, take some time with the right people in the room to really think about uh, and do the analysis necessary. And that's gonna take some time. But in the meanwhile, we'll continue to do the good work and try to provide better services in these areas like we're trying to describe tonight. Uh, the other uh, two technical advisory committees that we recommend to, the, to our ad hoc is to think about home hardening and defensible space, that home out approach. Who are the experts that should be in the room to really provide and promote the best ways to protect homes and uh, structurally harden those homes so that uh, things like ember cast do not start a home that will then uh, burn the rest of the community. So, uh, and then the other uh, factor is essentially what this uh, the level of expertise that this group tonight uh, offers is that landscape level vegetation management, that landscape in that uh, John uh, Mack will be able to share in just a moment. Look at the ways in which we can continue to do better ecological monitoring, restoration enhancement paired with wildfire resilience. I think those factors are something that we really need to address here on out. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, pass uh, the word to uh, John Mack, who works for Permit Sonoma. And that's one of the first recommendations is that our technical advisory team can help support uh, phase one of the planning and project selection process uh, in the five different uh, regions that the fuel hazardous fuel management grant program is starting up right now. So John, do you wanna share with us your presentation? Sure. Um, so thanks everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm just, I just have a couple of slides to touch on the highlights of where um, Permit Sonoma is focusing on. We are, as Kim has mentioned, closely collaborating with all the, all the, everyone working in, working in this area and it's a complicated area. Um, you can go to the first slide, Kim. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, as you know, Permit Sonoma, we, the area that we've sort of have focused on is what I sort of call people, structures, and land use. And that's our sort of area of expertise and sort of regulatory work um, in that. We're, we're very focused at the parcel scale on the structures and the people where the land use authority for the county. And so the, the work that we've been advancing and especially within um, seeking these large um, federal grants has really been focusing on at that scale of and that location of the landscape. Um, that's not to say that good work or necessary work isn't needed outside of the beyond the community, so to speak, but our focus has really been at that community scale. And as Kim's mentioned, um, our we try to take a holistic approach where we sort of are saying we're working from the house out, so from structure hardening and defensible space, and then looking at the landscapes around communities and saying what would need to be done to make those communities more resilient in the event of fire. Um, my, my close counterpart, Kelly on Safford within the Fire Prevention Division, um, they've taken on the, the main driver of the the house out component, not to say that they're not working in vegetation management, but in terms of these grants, that's the, been the emphasis of the parts of the program they're going to deliver. And then my division that permits Snowman, the natural resource division has been taking on the large scale vegetation management parts of these federal projects. Go ahead, next slide. So where, is our, where are we at today and what, uh, what funding do we have? Well, it breaks into basically sort of three main boxes. And, and in some respects, uh, these can be looked at almost as a progression because the first two that I'll talk about, these were funds that were applied for in 2018 and 2019. So the, most several years ago and multiple fires ago, we had we put together projects um, that, we, that at that point we thought FEMA would fund and were funded in the ways that FEMA wanted at that time. Um, so the first ones out the gate were our wildfire adapted um, grants. And these are really focusing on the, the house out component. Um, we have two of these grants, although they're basically one project. There's about 14 um, project areas around the county. Um, and at that point, FEMA was very focused on us having defined project areas. 
um, where we are doing assessments of defensible space and structures. Um, and we're nearing the end of that part of the project. And so the which is called the phase one part of the project. And that will be completed next year. And we'll have the assessments done. We'll have submitted our environmental review components to FEMA and other pieces. And then the next phase of those projects, which hopefully funding will come quickly thereafter. So maybe we're rolling that program up would be what's called a cost share program where actual monies will be made available to actual parcel owners um, to do the work, to harden their structures and install defensible space if they need if they need to. So there's that component. The second grant, which is also ramping up right now, is the hazardous fuels grant. And then and this is focusing more on large scale vegetation management. And we have four large project areas. I have a map in just a second um, that are in different locations in the county um, where we're going to be developing plans of what should be done in those areas to as far as vegetation management and then trying to deploy multiple projects there um, with and that again this is a phased project phase one will be wrapped ending at the end of next year and then hopefully the phase two dollars the implementation dollars will be released promptly by FEMA and then hope looking at actually putting projects on the ground in the 2024 25 time frame so those were those two projects you know like, like I said we thought of those projects in 18 and 19 and since then we sort of have just taken a more holistic approach and said well we really want to do that all at once at the whole community scale and so some of you have may have heard about the BRIC grant which is building resilient infrastructure and communities this is a grant we applied for in December of 20 which we still have not received um, so we're coming on two years since the application We've received word that maybe soon, <laughs> um, but this grant really tried to roll up and combine that approach holistically where we are gonna do structure hardening, defensible space and vegetation management in three communities, three large communities um, in the county that represent different types of landscapes, Lark Field, Wikiup, the Mark West Creek watershed, which is more of our oak woodland grassland. Gernwood, Gerber, and Reed Onido, sort of our red forest, Doug fir, very densely forested, and then Pengrove Sonoma Mountain, which is a more grassland, op open landscape. And so we're going to play out how to do this whole community planning and whole community deployment of these things all at once. So that's that's been the vision and sort of how it's built slowly at Permit Sonoma with um, trying to come up with this sort of whole community approach. And then the idea is we would then Roll, continue, re replicate that oh, through all the major communities across the county, such that we would have plans and, and, and programs to be deploying work in a coordinated fashion um, in those locations. And so you can put the last slide up, Kim. So just to briefly summarize where we're going to be working. Um, so the go ahead, next, you can click, Kim. So the red circles, these are the areas that are our project areas for our hazardous fuels grant. So this is the one that's just kicking off now that will end next year. And we, there's four large project areas, um, mostly located in former fire footprints with the exception of the one in the sort of Casadero vicinity um, there. Go ahead and click. Um, our brick project areas, those three communities are in the green circles. Um, so um, in that location, and then finally, are um, the orange circles are the locations where our wildfire adapted grants are deploying. And so you can sort of see that as the, the circles start overlapping and you, and also covering uh, quite a bit of uh, the, the land area of the county or at least spreading across the county and touching on many, many, many different community types. So that's sort of my brief summary of what Permit Sonoma is up to. We're closely collaborating with the vegetation grant program, as well as all the other partners, so that our projects are connecting up and filling gaps um, with other with the other programs and projects. That's all. Thank you, John. I really appreciate those comments and and uh, information. Um, this really, to us, is the the next layer, this next iteration we talked about, and. Thankfully, uh, the Permit Sonoma 
took the lead uh, shortly after the fires in 2017 and saw this opportunity through FEMA to be able to support these types of projects. But this is not an easy lift. And I think one of the things we have to recognize is that uh, any federal funding is a challenge to first acquire and convince uh, the uh, federal agencies that this is a good project work. But then implementation, there's a lot of uh, uh, things to consider when we apply this over uh, a large landscape. And so it's taken a little while, but in the meantime, I think the vegetation management grant program really has helped to uh, lead to better outcomes of what the FEMA grants are going to look like. Um, John is going to be uh, relying on the technical advisory committees to be able to help support the things such as homes uh, hardening and uh, project uh, site selection uh, across these large landscapes, trying to rely on these different experts in the field to be able to support these projects. So I'd like to open it up and I'll stop sharing my screen to see if uh, we get some more questions specific to the uh, FEMA grants and how those are gonna be rolled out. Um, and uh, uh, any panelists who, if you have any questions or comments about that, that's great. I've seen some great questions in the uh, Q and A. And so yeah, I wonder uh, if, if um, there's a question in the Q and A from uh, Matt Green about permitting, just the how, you know, the permitting isn't isn't there to scale up the level of work that is desired. And I wonder if um, if you could say anything about that, um, John, Mac, about progress on permitting and um, coordination with state agencies, for example, to enable larger scale projects. So our main, with, the, with these grant projects, our, we're planning that our main tool will be this CAL FIRE vegetation treatment program procedure that was outlined in their programmatic EIR. Um, so we're expecting, so we're gonna be looking to do projects under the federal grants that fit within that. Um, that approval pathway because it's quick enough um, to work within the scope of the grant. If it needed a higher level of secret review, based, so like a standalone document or review, then um, those projects will get noted and sort of kept, but not probably funded with the federal money because uh, those that process, that approval pathway is not fast enough to sort of work within the grant time timeframes. I will also note that we've been quite creative and successful in fitting projects into some of the categorical exemptions. So projects that are near structures or roads and, and things like that, we do fit often within a, a categorical exemption framework. And we've worked closely with Kim's program to fit projects into that wherever we can. Um, so that's the uh, that would be the other pathway. In terms of actual permitting, we're not uh, we're not expecting to do projects that would require, say, a 401 certification or a, for a Corps of Engineers permit or permits from Cal Fish and Wildlife. Um, so that we would be designing projects that that wouldn't need anything in those in that regard. And then if the project did need those things, we would be probably putting that on a separate track um, from projects that we'd be doing under our grants? That's a great question. Um, whoops. Um, I'm curious, um, is that, does that answer your question? Uh, Matt, would you like to uh, go live on that? Did that answer your question? That's uh, Matt Green that asked that question. Uh, while we're uh, waiting to see if Green, uh, Matt's available, um, there was a question by Jenny Blake, uh, Blaker, and, and I've seen it elsewhere, that um, they wanted to know the breakdown of uh, how much that has been spent countywide on structural hardening versus vegetation treatments. And I don't have that number offhand for the vegetation management grant program. It's been a little bit focused on more vegetation treatments on the landscape. But John, what is your breakdown for uh, the BRIC grants and the uh, hazardous fuel management grants? Do, can you give a... I think you've come up with a so, percentage. For the wildfire adapted, so that's structure hardening and defensible space, those were about $9.3 million total project cost. So 75% federal, 25% local. 
um, probably about seven million of it will feed into the cost share program. So, so that would be available at four, you know, two homeowners um, in the project areas. We have not spent any of the um, that money because we haven't gone into the phase two of implementation yet. On the hazardous fields grant, it's about a six million dollar project, and it's, I think we're expect, expecting to spend about four and a half million on projects, um, and those would be done in hopefully like 2020, mostly in 2024, maybe into 2025. And then the brick grant is about $48 million total project, 37 and a half million or so federal. Um, we're expecting to probably have spend over 40 million on the actual work. And it's sort of roughly set up in thirds that, so a third defensible space, a third structure hardening and a third vegetation management so you can do the you can do the division yourself <laughs> <laughs> okay is there uh, any other questions that are coming up i'm kind of tracking them as well um let me see uh d has asked about how the climate resilience land strategy is being incorporated into the work that we're doing um anna or barbara do you want to uh share your perspective on that or I can make an attempt to yeah I can I can I'm happy to jump in here and Kim you can also add to it or Barbara if you've got other thoughts to contribute here um but I I, I would emphasize that you know the the climate resilient land strategy which our board of supervisors just recently adopted I believe it was about a month ago um is first and foremost created to help uh the county prioritize and address climate action and making our natural and working lands more resilient to climate change. So really looking at our natural and working lands, which has some obvious overlap here with vegetation management, wildfire management. It's not all encompassing. Obviously, there's some areas of both efforts that might not overlap, but there is quite a bit of overlap with that both Kim and I have noted and um, are constantly trying to collaborate our and coordinate our efforts on this. Um, in terms of how these two efforts will engage. It'll likely look like some um, engagement groups, both internally within the county and also with external partners um, being coordinated so that we're tapping into these groups of people in a coordinated effort as opposed to asking questions to people in duplicate times and duplicate sessions, and hopefully being able to, to not knowledge share and collaborate on projects and initiatives so that we can be more effective and efficient with, with what we're implementing. Kim or Barbara, do you want to add anything to that? Barbara, do you would like to know you good? Um, I think that's a, a good example of you know the levels of uh, collaboration we want to try to do, and so um, the def, there's a variety of different technical advisory committees that we are uh, advocating for, and one of which would be the group that's working on climate change and the land strategies. How do we apply that? They have a working group they're developing it. So we really want all uh, county departments to buy into the system of using the technical advisory committees to really work with different partners who are uh, highlighted for those different uh, topics and be able to share lessons learned, share ways in which we are monitoring ecological impacts and ways in which uh, the practices are on, done on the ground and how that's going to roll out as a positive. Uh, a net positive as far as human safety, as well as protection of those natural resources. So I think that's the way where the collaborating as best as possible right now. But again, and, I think one of the things that um, Supervisor Gore had shared with you all is that these are, are simply our recommendations that would go to the larger board of supervisors in a more consolidated way. Uh, but this really is just our opportunity to share some of the things we've learned uh, through the management of the vegetation management program, uh, working with uh, uh, CAL FIRE, working with Permit Sonoma, working with the different um, uh, NGO partners to help us figure out how to best do this. But part of that equation is absolutely um, our community participation. So we've worked with a lot of different groups who are helping us to charter through these lands and trying to figure out how the best way to get the funding out to groups that are ready and able to apply this on the ground, but also to how to address this in the future. How do we improve the programs that um, 
uh, uh, permit Sonoma is developing so that we have a more holistic approach to uh, protecting our communities and as well as our natural resources. Um, Kim, so I, I would I would simply add that we're also very mindful of the fact that um, all of you who are, have been generous enough to give your time to us this evening have um, you have a lot of demands on your time, and so we're trying to do this in a way that is respectful and not asking you to participate in six different um, collaboration or advisory groups, but really to to try to structure this so that we can get your input and we can share it amongst ourselves and, and you can get the information you want from us um, with as little overlap of, of time or um, duplication of effort. Uh, so it, it may take us uh, a little bit of time to get it right, but that is our goal. And I would also to just, just add and emphasize all that Barbara and both Kim just said, but also highlight uh, Chair Gore when he did his um, kind of opening welcoming statement tonight, he mentioned, you know, trying to do risk reduction in a way that's also environmentally conscious and we're big believers in co-benefits and, and not just looking from one lens as we're doing these projects, because there's obviously a lot that needs to be done um, to help on a lot of different issues. And there's overlap with uh, wildfire issues, with vegetation management, invasives, ecosystem, and climate. And so, you know, both both our, the Climate Action Resiliency Division within the County Administrator's Office and Ag and Open Space, we definitely try to overlap and, and coordinate when we can so that we can maximize those benefits um, when we have these sorts of efforts on the ground. Thank you, Barbara and Anna. Those are great comments. Um, so one of the things I've been participating on since uh, 2005 is the Sonoma County Forest Conservation Working Group. And I, I just really appreciate that group because it's such a consortium of different, in, uh, different landowners, resource managers, uh, NGOs, uh, county agencies, state agencies. And we all get together to uh, once a month to try to think about how to best address these things. And um, I think the, the level of scale really comes down to this. I remember um, uh, one of our members is uh, Dee Swanhauser. She's one of our founders and she was all about the, the small landowners and she would uh, go to the map for the, the small landowners. I, I super, I very much appreciate that. But then Ag and Open Space looks at the larger landscapes and other organizations also look at uh, large landscapes. So it's trying to find that balance. Where, where do landowners, Again, we came up with a stat that uh, over 95% of the uh, forested parcels uh, were of less than uh, 50 acres and uh, in private land ownership. So that complicates our life when it comes to managing our resources in a, a way that's equitable, that's uh, sensitive to what the landowner is interested in really doing on that land. Um, and by contrast, uh, Marin County has 75% of its land holdings in uh, federal lands. So those, those types of statistics change in Sonoma County. So we have to be uh, creative and, um, and we have to collaborate together, trying to figure out ways in which we work from the home out and the landscape in and, and try to be as collaborative as possible. So I think that's what we're really trying to emphasize here. Um, we only have a couple other slides that I'd like to share with you all. Um, and with that, I'll share my screen again. Um, and there we go. And so with that, uh, our next slide is one of the, uh, an additional thematic area that the Cleve report had uh, recommended was to look at the labor and workforce development. And on our technical advisory committee, we've had a number of great advocates for trying to recognize that we have a number of different uh, resources that we can tap into and some aren't as equitable as possible. And so we have a uh, youth groups, at, uh, uh, youth at risk that are creating crews and seeing this as a great opportunity to serve uh, the county and, and get a good job to be able to uh, work up through this uh, ladder of uh, professional advancement, but there doesn't seem to be many opportunities for that. So I'm, I'd really like to highlight some of the things that have happened. And that is with the Sonoma or the Santa Rosa uh, Junior College, they are creating that one of those paths and trying to train people on how to do uh, wildfire resilient work. So uh, that means 
fuel treatments. That means uh, how to do prescribed burns, how to uh, uh, control invasive plant populations, and trying to uh, train uh, college level students in uh, this uh, arena of best management practices and how they should be applied here in Sonoma County, which I think is uh, huge. Another factor of this is uh, one of the grants that we approved in 2022 is the Vegetation Management Handbook for Sonoma County. And that's being led by Sonoma Ecology Center, UC Extension, Ag and Open Spaces participating, a number of other uh, nonprofit organizations in the area to try to provide the best treatments that are uh, available to us on, or available to landowners that are going to be aware of uh, the impacts of natural, uh, on natural re uh, resources, watershed, how to protect watersheds, how to protect riparian corridors while creating a more fire, wildfire resilient landscape. So those are the things that we really hope to roll out uh, both at the, the conference in April, but also as we get more input, we want to have workshops to be able to share these things. And more than anything, I think one of the best places to learn is on the ground, in the field, in the forest, closer to the homes, understanding how defensible space can be done in a way that's also uh, respectful of the natural resources that exist there. So those are the types of trainings I hope are, are in the future. Um, the two recommendations we came up with in this particular category was to create these county fuel agencies. Uh, the North Sonoma uh, County uh, Fire District has a fuel uh, program where their crews are going out and helping to do treatments of it across a variety of different landscapes. The Sonoma Valley Fire District has another crew that's available to be able to do these types of treatments. And they really have this a uh, little bit of a, 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 a professional ladder that people can advance to. And Fire Forward has presented to the Technical Advisory Committee a really uh, comprehensive look about how to move uh, in a way in which we can create uh, through apprentice programs and practitioners train people. They've been able to train 350 uh, wildfire, uh, um, basic trained uh, wildfire fighters um, uh, to be able to work in Sonoma County. But one of the issues, they don't have a job coming out of that training program. So how do we work together to try to provide that infrastructure to be able to grow? And I think that's the type of thing that we really need to spend more time on and think about ways in which the, uh, that can become a reality. Uh, do any of the panelists want to comment on this particular topic area? Okay, hearing crickets, we'll move on. All right, so I, I just love this photo. This is from Fire Safe Sonoma, or Fire Forward, uh, just showing some of the crews that they've been able to train. It's just all these uh, great uh, people doing the work on the ground. Um, and next slide. So kind of to wrap up our, our presentation part, and we then can go to uh, some of our questions and answer period, is that one of the things we really see is it's the community collaborative capacity building. Essential to the success of any vegetation management is really trying to figure out how to create these positive partnerships between what the county agencies are capable of doing in-house versus all those partners who are working on the land, working with different communities, trying to find those collaboratives and how to make them as most successful as possible. Uh, we recommended the three different uh, technical advisory committees that can be supported uh, to help us figure out that organizational structure and funding and what that looks like in the future. Um, the, we would really like to create a, a similar technical advisory committee for home hardening and defensible space so that it can really work, figure out what are the best practices that can be applied to a variety of different communities based on the habitat type they're uh, living within. Uh, so it's going to be different when you look at Rionito compared to, say, a Katati, when you're looking at two completely different landscapes, uh, two different types of fuel. So how do those uh, need to change? And then finally, we'd like to see the success of the, veg the uh, landscape level vegetation management, looking at that landscape in, looking at ecological health, uh, restoration and enhancement that uh, paired with wildfire resilience. So that's a really uh, critical factor to our success. 
And then finally, we think that facilitating and enhancing these efforts on a regional scale. Uh, uh, we mentioned, for instance, the Sonoma Valley um, Wildlands Collaborative, uh, the Sonoma Coast uh, Collaborative, where people are working together to try to figure out, all right, are our evacuation routes as clear as they can be? Uh, are, can we start doing some, um, some uh, uh, prescriptive grazing or prescriptive fires so that we can maintain um, a, a landscape that's going to be compatible with wildfire and ways in which we can reduce the risk to our homes and our communities. Um, we like to advocate for more workshops, technical advisors or community collaborators that can work with these specific collaborations and see uh, through experiential learning how to get the work done on the land on the land as best as possible. And then one, one other factor that we wanted to recommend was uh, creating a task force, a, a tree mortality task force. Uh, we we heard a, an excellent presentation by Michael Jones of the UC Cooperative Extension that talks about the threat of beetles and, uh, and outbreaks of different uh, species as we are facing uh, drought conditions, if we're looking at uh, ways in which to protect our natural landscapes, we have to take a look at those threats uh, in a serious way and be and do it in a way that's as cooperative as possible. So with that, I think um, the last slide I wanted to share with you would be uh, our county timeline. These are all the different projects we've mentioned and you can see it gets complicated, but there's a lot of overlapping factors where we see the development and uh, application of the, um, the wild uh, fire resilience planner, that last uh, row. Uh, the CWPP is in its last draft that we hope to get approved by the Board of Supervisors in February, uh, and then uh, begin implementation. The grant, the vegetation management grant program that Ag and Open Space has been managing, we see that folding into the CWPP uh, by January so that the projects that get uh, committed by February 1st will be considered for funding uh, in uh, February and March so that we can roll those out and have new grant agreements, but through that CWPP portal. Um, John and his team are going to be launching uh, the project selection for the uh, hazardous fuel management programs in each of the districts throughout the county. I think that's a huge advance. It's going to take some time to figure out what are the best projects to support. And through the technical support that uh, our team is able to offer, I think that will make some advances. And we're really excited about the BRIC uh, grant as a way to show that we can do it on a community scale. And then finally, I'm just going to another pitch for the Living with Fire Sonoma County Forest Conservation um, or Forest Management Conference in April. We hope that we'll have more people participate in that. Again, to have more opportunities to share experiences and concerns about how these things progress. So with that, I think um, I would like to just open this up to a variety of different uh, opinions and, and comments. Um, first, I'll, I'll uh, ask the uh, presenter or the panelists to share any thoughts that they might have uh, based on any questions that may have came up during the, the interview. Uh, let's start with Supervisor Gore or Supervisor Hopkins, if you guys have any specific comments uh, uh, based on all the material presented tonight. Supervisor, you want to go ahead? I'm actually just looking forward to hearing additional thoughts from members of the public. I feel like um, they get to listen to us a lot and look forward to hearing from them. That yeah, good. and you. likewise, just reiterating that we also, we have tonight, we also have the board item, which will come uh, to us in mid-December. And then the goal is also for our ad hoc to continue through April when we have the uh, convening. And probably at that time would be an appropriate time for us to figure out final recommendations and get out of the way. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, other panelists, um, would you like to share any comments? Chief Nichols, you've been incredibly quiet tonight. What's the deal with that? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but... Um, we do have a couple of questions in the q and if you want to go there. All right, great, uh, let's do that. Um, would right. you like to, what's Yeah, I wanted to here? ask um, if John Mack could look at Matt Green's question and think about responding to that. And while you're thinking about that, because it's a little bit long, I wanted to see if maybe Carolyn could respond to one of Jenny Blaker's many excellent questions here. Um, and the one I was thinking would be good for Carolyn is, 
are there training programs for structural hardening, which could create many more well-paid local jobs? Well, um, we're actually just now in the very early stages of launching our structure assessment program for the wildfire adapted. And I think that out of that, um, those trainings will um, become more available. Um, I would love to first um, put those out to fire district personnel, who I think that when they're out there doing assessments in the communities, it's really great if those um, fire district assessors do have uh, better than passing understanding of what structure hardening is. Um, it's a relatively complex topic. It's not super simple to just say, yeah, we just have to do this. This is the first priority because typically your structure hardening um, measures are highly site dependent and are, you know, what's a really high priority for one house might not be as high for another. So it does require a significant amount of expertise. You can get a passing knowledge of it, but um, yeah, I'd certainly hope that we'll get more of this um, moving forward in the future. It's where my heart lies in. Um, I just wanna say really quick too, that I'm so gratified to get so many questions about this really important topic. It used to be sort of structure what? Structure hardening? What does that mean? And we've moved way beyond that. And it is an extremely important element of what we're talking about in combination with uh, maintaining and creating really good defensible space. And my last thing is, the more we can do this, like Permit Sonoma, the projects that John was talking about, those are purposely launched on a community-wide scale in given footprints. And the reason why is that what we're hoping for is community-wide action rather than individual houses here and there. Thank you. John, do you want to take a whack at Matt Green's question? Yeah, Matt has a has a really great question. He's he's basically he's discussing like how we're going to deal with endangered, especially endangered species. He uses he uses northern spotted owl as an example, and and makes the great point that you know those they're they're very sensitive species that could be impacted just by the operation of the noise from a piece of equipment potentially if you're there at the wrong time of the year. Um, so it's a so I will say this is something that I frankly am very personally very concerned about with these projects and with vegetation management in general. And in that I want to develop procedures and methods for not only figuring out where we should work, but also where we shouldn't <laughs> in a sense, or where we can work with a heavier hand versus where we should work with a much lighter hand given the quality of the resource. And I would say that goes to from both the community scale. So there should at the whole community scale say, you know, sensitive natural plant communities, very high quality forests, very mature forests. Those are places where we need to be able to identify those as we're scoping the project and um, decide what, if anything, we want to we need to do there or can do there. Um, in terms of the regulatory protections, so the CAL FIRE VTP program has built into it basically, from my perspective, the same level of data collection that would go almost into a typical initial study under CEQA. So and it covers the whole range of biology, hydrology, cultural resources, and so on. And so there's a whole data collection piece. And then there's a whole set of pre-built, in a sense, mitigations or um, mitigative measures or timing measures and so on that you have to follow in order to fall within the purview of the BTP. And those were developed with a statewide perspective looking at species like NSO, you know, Northern Spotted Owl, among others. So the assumption is if you're following that procedure, you, you, it should be protective. Um, so, and then similarly, if you're moving into some type of higher level secret document, say a standalone initial study, negative declaration kind of document, then you would have to be going species by species and, and making those evaluations. Um, so I think there are protections that are there built into the existing regulatory systems. And 
like I said, there could be situations where you need some type of individual permit, uh, an individual take permit or something like that. And that would just, that project would then be flagged by that and, and might be much more difficult to proceed with in terms of fitting it into a grant project with a very tight time frame versus that project might take a much longer turnaround in order to obtain its approvals and make sure that it's done protectively and correctly. Um, so it's sort of a long answer to that, but I think we're very, we're very conscious of that. There's a reason that vegetation management is operating out of my division, where we are, we do environmental review, and that's our day-to-day -day business. And um, because that's, we are expecting those issues to be front and center in many, many, many months. So. Thanks, John. I really appreciate that comment. Um, ben, do you have a comment? I just felt bad you, you uh, called me out. So I want to uh, put it out there that uh, I caught the message from Len Garrick uh, and also Jason Majors about their concerns and frustrations trying to get work on the ground. So um, it is not a secret. We're not trying to hold any information back from. Uh, we look forward to working with Lynn um, in the Upper West Mark, in the Upper Mark West watershed um, to daisy chain uh, her future projects that she would like to do. Uh, into the critical work we're doing at Pepperwood uh, and the surrounding area. So the Mark West Corridor obviously is, is something near and dear to my heart and most of my firefighters. And we want to make sure that we're uh, preparing that community for that future fire event. Thank you. Hey, Ben, I, I wondered if you wanted to um, respond to a concern that uh, Tom um, Conlin had suggested about uh, salvage harvesting. Um, do you have any comments about that? Or um, just to be clear that a vegetation management grant program would not support a, a salvage harvest operation that uh, falls under a different jurisdiction and is typically a commercial um, entity. So that is a different um, qualification for us. Yeah, so the, the salvage logging obviously ties back to the timber harvest rules, and that would be with our resource management folks. I'd be happy to steer them in the right direction, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a profitable or a for-profit activity that I don't think is covered underneath the grant uh, activities. Right, okay, good. Um, and then um, I think there is one person who has a hand raised. I wonder if they wanted to um, be unmuted, um, Stuart? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, David. Oh, great. Hi. So that's uh, David Rosen. And, and, and on behalf of Rio Nito, just wanted to say, just so grateful for all the work that you all are putting into this and all these different agencies coming together. It's fantastic. And I also, I liked a lot the idea of the collaborative work with, with local, ideally with youth and with local residents to learn how to do some of this work. And not only just the, the really heavy lifting, but the vegetation management that, that, that often is gonna get uh, in, overlooked with the invasive species and stuff when we're looking at the bigger picture. These are the kinds of things that the training on local levels can be very, very helpful for, and also employ people, especially around in Rio Nido in, in our area there. Uh, and just a quick question for John, when the BRIC grant eventually comes through, does it come through as one uh, in lump sum, or is it gonna be parsed out? Do you know? Um, the BRIC grant comes in, is a phased project. So we get the first phase, which is the planning, basically the planning phase, planning permitting phase um, first. And then, and then we have to request that the phase $2 be released after we've gotten through phase one and all the environmental review and so on. And then the other thing is we don't receive money in a lump at all, it's a reimbursement grant. So we have to spend the money first ah, okay. and then request reimbursement, which is even better. Yeah. <laughs> <From> <laughs> Lovely, just a little, little more time consuming. Yeah. But since it has been signed in theory by the president, so it will come at, at some point. And does, does when the first phase begin to manifest, does that confirm that the rest of the grant will over time come through or, or is it all still possible to be pulled? Uh, it's fair. I mean, it's when you, if they're giving you the first phase, then they're, that, that's saying they want to give you the second phase. So it's sort of yours to screw up in a sense. So if you, if you successfully complete the first phase, then your expectation is you're going to, they'll be releasing 
for the second phase. Got it. And I believe they're supposed to be at the federal scale or federal budgetary scale, they're sort of obligating or setting aside the whole project cost, so to speak. Okay, got you. And thank you all again. This is great. Thanks. And thank you, David, for your comment. And just a, a piggyback off your comment about the value of having local expertise. I think that's been one thing I've seen consistently with the uh, vegetation grant agreements that we worked with. And that uh, when there was a local um, resource manager or a company that was uh, had a, a skin in the game, if you will, people who, uh, a great example would be the Fort Ross Road uh, community where they have many landowners who are volunteering on weekends to on chipper days. Uh, they have a chipper they now can help to manage some of the roads in that area. Uh, they have crews that are from that area. And so they're working so hard and realize it's for the benefit of the whole community. And so those types of experiences I've seen uh, through the veg management grant, I was also up on Bennett Ridge uh, where they're doing great work on uh, uh, their uh, removing some eucalyptus uh, stands that are very that were burned uh, in the Tubbs fire uh, or probably the Nuns fire, and then uh, had the potential to impact their water system. And so they uh, had a local crew that's really been working closely with them on their evacuation routes and their specific um, uh, uh, community assets like their water tanks to be able to protect. That type of collaboration was has been uh, very beneficial in many cases. Kim, are you open to more questions from the Q&A? Of course. So um, there have been a couple of questions that are um, um, they're related to what John Mack was just talking about, about valuing natural resources or rare species in planning and prioritizing and, and, and prescribing uh, work on the ground. But they're a little different. They're more about how do we monitor the impacts of work that is going on now, or mm -hmm. what kind of oversight is there for grants that have already been um, put out through the veg management program, for example, to make sure that those projects are not causing undue harm or to monitor what kind of impacts they are having, because right. these projects do have impacts. Um, right. So is there anyone who could respond to that angle? Um, I'll take the first crack at it. And then if uh, maybe John or, or Ben have any comments on that, that would be great too. Uh, one of the things that uh, many of the projects uh, tried to use from an environmental compliance perspective was the notice of exemption, where they were within a certain distance of a, a structure or a road uh, that um, would allow them to use that use of the uh, CEQA uh, coverage. And so in that case, uh, they were obligated to work with uh, Permit Sonoma and uh, submitted their notice of exemption to us we reviewed it, but also in many cases, uh, Permit Sonoma uh, took a careful look at whether uh, there were in a specific area where uh, a rare plant might be in the area and what practices they would use to be able to protect that particular species if present. Uh, did they do any pre, um, pre work uh, surveys, pre treatment surveys, um, and whether they were in the bird uh, nesting season, uh, were bird nest uh, surveys done at that time? So, those are kind of the things that the uh, Permit Sonoma, with our guidance, uh, tried to use as best management practices so that we could avoid any uh, in incidental takes of a rare uh, plant or animal. Um, the, uh, the other um, way I could probably address that question is the use of the California Vegetation Treatment uh, Program, which is a longer and more in-depth analysis of uh, for environmental compliance. It's a CEQA level uh, evaluation, but that is for a longer term treatment. And so in that uh, process, you have to do a formal study of the cultural uh, resources, the environmental resources uh, that are on this particular area that you're going to um, do your treatment on and list what treatments you'll be using, what will be your best management practices. That's a longer, uh, more in-depth study that we are using for some of the shaded fuel break projects. So we're not allowing them just to go right on the ground and start doing their work. It's more of a planning process in the initial phase, identify any rare or endangered species that might be present, and then how are they going to adjust 
their practices to be able to make sure uh, those plants or animals are protected. Um, and then, so I'll toss it to John or uh, Ben to see if they have any comments about uh, monitoring. And, and maybe Hattie, if you have any comments about had, uh, how uh, regional parks uses their uh, different skill sets to monitor impacts of your treatments in that area, that would be great to share. I'm not sure who's supposed to go first. Um, John, I'll go one, John uh, and then Ben. And I will. Um, comments and the, then my comment will be if going back, if you recall earlier in the talk when T Kim was presenting this sort of continuum slide of the different actions, and he highlighted a box towards the bottom, which was basically on monitoring and assessment adaptive management, and um, which is a, actually a topic near and dear to my heart. <laughs> but um, I think that's some, I think. From my perspective, that's like the next sort of hurdle for us to um, start thinking about how, if we're going to intervene in the landscape, we want to then determine if we've been successful and what the effect of that is, which requires some type of monitoring and assessment, going back and taking a look, collect, deciding, you know, deciding how we're going to measure it, what kind of data we're going to collect, and then collecting it and then intervening in the landscape and then repeating on some type of a schedule. Um, we haven't really gotten there yet in terms of the big thinking about this program. We've been more focused on trying to get it, get things going within the permitting or review parameters that, that are out there. So it's a great question. I think it's critical, but um, it's, and it's on the list, but we haven't figured it out. I'll just make it brief that ultimately monitoring wise, the, the time that that comes into play would be uh, if it was a, a CAL FIRE awarded grant that the, the applicant has to, to um, provide documentation about what the treatment looks like when it's done. Um, so that would be possibly a, a component of the monitoring, but otherwise the scope of the work identified in the original vegetation treatment program document would, would be covering what was supposed to be completed during that process. Uh, but as far as an official monitoring component, there is, there's not one that I'm aware of. So I can answer to the vegetation management grant program. Um, the applicants are required to report uh, on uh, three phases of their project. One is to provide a narrative and a fiscal report on uh, the progress of their report, uh, of their treatments, and any kind of things, <coughs> excuse me, that may have prevented them from completing the, uh, the grant agreement. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, so the other part of that is I, I do field uh, visits to make sure that the projects are progressing as uh, on time <clears throat> and are going to meet their objectives. So while I'm on the ground, I are, do have a chance to see the practices being used by whatever uh, contracted uh, labor source, uh, make sure that uh, they are working within the restricted area. If there's um, nesting birds, if they've been properly flagged. So trying to monitor that factor um, on uh, these visits uh, to each particular grants. Um, I've been probably been able to visit uh, at least 75% of the project so far. So <clears throat> we're working on that process, but I think we could probably bolster that and have greater expertise to be able to visit those sites on a regular basis. Hattie, do you care to um, join on that conversation about how uh, things are monitored on your properties and in regional parks? Thanks, Kim. I don't. I don't think I have a whole lot to add. Um, you know, we're basically using the same tools that that have been articulated al already um, by the panel, complying with Cal VTP or other standard um, kind of environmental compliance. Adding a lot of monitoring and trying to kind of learn from each project and and capitalize and use those new tools and lessons in the next. Um, and, and trying to really amplify pace and scale, not only um, of what you know, is, is happening throughout the county, but what's happening also on county-owned lands of which regional parks is a significant player. Thank you very much. I, I, I've been really so impressed with the crew that Hattie has put together on their natural resources division and being able to do the work on the ground with uh, people who are very familiar with uh, the landscapes that they're working with. Their mission is uh, public access. And so they have to combine 
uh, treatments that are looking at wildfire resilience, as well as the protection of natural resources within those areas, as well as public uh, accessing those lands. So I really appreciate the work that you guys do at regional parks. Um, and, and, and I think that's uh, getting back to the outreach and education. I think there's so many opportunities for us to share some of the lessons learned on these different properties. Uh, Ag and Open Space is also very much involved with a number of different treatments on lands that either have been burned and looking at, at post-fire uh, treatments uh, using shaded fuel breaks, trying to figure out uh, burn units where prescribed burn could be reintroduced to help maintain the, the landscape in, in a different way. So um, those lessons learned and the types of activities that each of our different departments are using, I think uh, serve as an excellent um, uh, education and experiential learning for folks who are interested in going out there. Um, so do we have any other comments or hey, questions Kim, that come up? Kim, do you mind if I lean in on one? I saw I saw one question that came in that was around who is trying to work sure work to make sure that PG&E is accountable to upgrading equipment and other things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we've done is not just to, well, I want to be very clear, it's very difficult to advocate uh, for change with uh, a utility in this way. And so instead of going to the legislature and other things, which we have and we've done, uh, it's mostly through the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission. And so we actually have uh, counsel and uh, counsel as an outside attorney. Uh, it's the same attorney that's represented by the California State Association of Counties, but also by a consortium of counties in the North Bay and others that have come together. To, uh, to, to, to ensure that the filings into the CPUC ensure accountability and action. Um, if you talk about the equipment and then on the other side, the pg and veg management program and then undergrounding and then other things, <coughs> obviously that's a deeper conversation. If that's something we need to look at when we get together in April, that might be appropriate. Um, that's usually when a lot of veg management work goes. And I wanna um, just, put that one down and there was another question that was, or, or, or concern that was expressed about having uh, burns happen in October when people are uh, sensitive. And I wanna acknowledge that um, and honor the fact that it is difficult. We do live in difficult times. And when there's smoke in the air, there's a lot of people who, uh, um, who get very nervous. Um, but at the same time, I wanna acknowledge that with the fire professionals and when we, have a good fire alliance and all these uh, actions is, is that, you know, uh, we have to condition ourselves to be okay when there's smoke in the air and when it's not a red flag warning. And uh, it's one of the things that we talk a lot about with Ben Nichols and others when we've had our other uh, efforts is that when we have wildfires, um, but we're not in a red flag condition with the upstaffing and the other resources we put on the table, not only as a board, but the fire districts in Cal Fire and the Cal Fire unit that's now at Los Gilicos and has a camp there and other things is, um, it does, we're, not, we're not perfect, but we are in a place where we have local ground forces and people on for when it's those real difficult situations. Just reiterating that the fires that we have had that have turned catastrophic have been wind driven. Um, so uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, folks. It's uh, 6.58, and I promised to let you go at 7 o'clock, so I really appreciate all the information that you folks have shared. Uh, I know there's a couple of other questions that are uh, burning right now, but um, let if we could just uh, promise to get back to you in, in, uh, in off, offline, uh, we will try to do our best to get back to those. We will capture the questions and try to provide some a written response. Um, with that, I wanted to share one last slide that um, uh, goes to, let me see, uh, I don't want that one. <laughs> Let's go all the way to Anne if you can. So, um, and just to give uh, my contact information, um, this is where you can provide any other feedback on this particular president. One of the things that we wanted to ask from you, is this a format that really works for you? Uh, it's a lot of information. I apologize for a lot of um, uh, information that we share with you. Uh, we tried to break it up with some question and answers. Uh, is this style working for you? Do we break it into smaller chunks or more specific topics? I'm happy to get feedback on that. Uh, if you have other questions about 
where this is going. Please feel free to send me an email. That's probably the best way to contact me. But I left my phone there in case you wanted to leave a message or contact me directly. So uh, with that, I, again, I would like to mention that um, we are we did record this service or the, this presentation, um, and that we will um, have that available to you and to anybody who wasn't able to uh, participate tonight and share it on the county website as well as the Ag and Open Space work websites. Um, I want to really uh, thank our Spanish interpreters, Julie and Daniel, for uh, the work that they've been able to do. Uh, we didn't speak very slowly. <laughs> there was a lot of information. So we really appreciate that tough task of uh, interpreting our language. So um, I really appreciate our panelists. Thank you very much, Supervisor Gore and Supervisor Hopkins for participating tonight and, um, and your, for your leadership in this er arena and for all the great panelists that who participated tonight. So thank you very much, folks. We, we appreciate your time. Have a good night. Thank you, folks.